welcome, uh, welcome colleagues, friends, uh, on this very rainy and somewhat cold day uh, on a very interesting topic. But before we begin the proceedings, may I invite Professor Mitra to speak, say a few words to welcome our former colleagues. Professor Riyaz Hassan, guests, members of the ISAS research community, ladies and gentlemen. It's a rare opportunity for me to welcome back one of our own, because, uh, because Dr. Mizanur Rahman is the quintessential migrant who is both a migrant and a scholar on migrations and keeps migrating. Having migrated from Bangladesh to Singapore, he's now in Brunei, and I don't suppose the trail stops there. Because that's the whole idea of migration. It's a process and not an event. Um, the question that you would be asking, you should be asking is, why is ISAS organizing this lecture? Because a think tank must budget its time rationally and optimally. So I have asked the chairman to give me two minutes to explain the connectivity of this talk with the mandate of ISAS. ISAS has three major commitments in terms of connecting South Asia to Singapore and Singapore to South Asia. These are the three areas of economy and governance. And the third area is foreign policy. So what does migration have to do with them? First and foremost, when it comes to migration, some countries, particularly Bangladesh and India, certainly, or for that matter, Pakistan, get a lot of remittances. And it's an important part of their economy, both directly and indirectly. Directly in terms of the cash, indirectly in terms of the connectivity and the opportunities that they bring. So migration, in that sense, fits in to the first of our three major clusters. Second, when you migrate, it's not just capital and talent which travels. With that also, there is a possibility of the migration of lurking danger. So the migrant can be a source of new energy for the economy, but also a threat to the state. So migration and uh, terrorism are also connected, for example. So in that sense, migration certainly fits in to the foreign policy dimension of Singapore and South Asia connectivity. The third one is the most difficult one. And Dr. Mizan is a sociologist, so he's our chairman. So that's the sociological dimension that I would touch on now. What is a migrant? Is it so much labor power brought in to do a job? Or is it also a human being? Is the migrant worker also entitled to some of the things which make human beings citizens? Now, I have lived a long time in Germany, and only Germans use this word. They are, German is a very explicit language. I mean, they don't beat about the bush. So they call the migrant Gastarbeiter. He's a guest worker. You have come to do a job, and you're a guest, so don't ask for more. You have done it, you go. But what happens to the aspiration of the migrant to feel home in his new home? Is it possible to think of the migrant in terms of, I'll now welcome the High Commissioner of Bangladesh. Sir, please come and have a seat. And the Deputy High Commissioner, please, please, please. No, okay. I was introducing the topic in terms of the mandate of ISA, so I was talking about the third dimension of migration, which is the sociological dimension, and it's linked to the governance dimension. Is the migrant a citizen? That is an important issue for ISA, because ISA has a signature event called South Asian Diaspora Convention. The last one brought in 1,200 movers and shakers of the world. And I was asked to connect 
the South Asia Diaspora Convention to ISAS mandate in terms of an academic panel. So the panel I put together was a panel on transnational citizenship. Citizenship, as we normally understand it, is a concept which gives you some rights and obligations. That's typically the sons of the soil. That you can stand where you stand without anybody's permission as long as you want. That's a citizen. The connectivity of that right then to the obligation to fight for those rights or fight those who will question that right. So the citizen is simultaneously a maker of the state and its beneficiary. Now, can the migrant be a citizen? Now, that is one of these tricky issues because, of course, migrants want it both ways. To test this proposition, I had just arrived. Our chairman asked me to join a poetry reading session by migrant workers. I said, Chairman, why do we have a poetry reading session? He said, go and find out for yourself. And I'm a Bengali, so I was asked to vet the migrant poetry before they were recited. I was amazed. What do migrants do in their free time? Migrants in Singapore, they write poetry, they recite them, like you would recite poetry. They're properly trained. But what is that poetry about? It's not at all about rebelliousness or anger. It's about aspiration, love, and longing. They're longing for the mother, the sister, the daughter, and the beloved they left behind. In writing, they are trying to connect themselves to the home away from home, but they're writing for somebody. So the second poetry reading session that we went to, I went there with my wife, I was, we were amazed to find how few migrants were there and how many natives were there. The room was over full in the, uh, the uh, parliament building, which is now an art building. And it was full of young Singaporeans connecting. Or in other words, if culture is a conveyor of citizenship, that evening made the migrants fellow citizens. Now, these are some of the issues that are important to ISIS because we are two institutions in one. We are a think tank. Our job is to, sir, oh welcome to Mr. Pillai, to our midst. The job of ISAS is to connect. The mandate requires us to connect South Asia. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us. To, as a think tank, we have to think about how to negotiate the problem of citizenship for these temporary citizens. How can we reconcile the rights of the sons of the soil with the guests of the soil? What policies can we make? What can we learn? And what can we teach? After all, Singapore wouldn't be Singapore without migrants. And at the same time, Singapore is Singapore. And one must have a boundary around who is a Singaporean, who is not a Singaporean. These are very, very complex issues. So what kind of policies can be made? What can we learn? What can we teach? That's one of the outputs of ISAS. The second one brings me to the second identity of ISAS. ISAS is a research institute, a proud member of a very proud university called the NUS. Those three magical letters mean a lot to us. So what have we got to contribute to the theoretical knowledge of migration in terms of work that we do? There, Dr. Mizan is a great model. He has written book after book after book on a very specific field of remittances. That's one kind. The other kind is transnational citizenship. Because this is a problem both for sons of the soil, sons and daughters of the soil, as well as the visitor. The visitor himself has a problem because once he becomes, once a migrant gets a PR and becomes a citizen, he still has a problem. And this is, I'll say this and stop. This is a problem not of Bangladeshi migrants to Singapore, but Jewish German migrants to the United States. In the late 30s, for a variety of reasons, Jews of uh, Germany had to flee. 
this particular migrant called Schutz. He's a young sociologist like you. He runs away and finds a foothold, a toehold rather, as a lift operator in the New School for Social Research in New York. He finds a foothold, makes a living, and becomes a sociologist and is writing about migrants and identity. He's, it's a tiny little article. You can get it on the internet. It's called The Stranger. Schutz says, a migrant, once he's confident, he learns a new language, he learns the new jokes and new idioms, he masters the accent, and then he asks himself, now I'm somebody, I've got a new name, and my future is that of the United States, the United States is my future, but what do I do about my past? Because you can change the present and the future. You can't change the past. For example, you can't rewrite names on a tombstone. You can't say Mr. Dash, no. Mr. Mitra's tombstone cannot be changed to say, uh, here lies Mr. Dash. So what do you do with the past? So Schutz says, to be at peace with himself, the migrant must make his past a blank, a void. He must estrange himself from his past. Now, that is not possible. That is why the danger of migrants aspiring to the caliphate or to some glory of some religion becomes an issue. That is how the problem of alienation of the migrant as stranger is connected to a much, much bigger issue which is the big issue of our times. It can go all the way to suicide terrorism. That's why the chairman's idea of the poetry reading was, I think, such a good idea, so that the migrant can have, have it both ways, have the comfort of Singapore and identity of Bangladesh, for example, if it is possible. But that's the stuff of research. We do that too. And that's why we put together this panel on transnational citizenship in the South Asia Diaspora Convention. There will be another South Asia Diaspora Convention next year. And I hope ISIS will remain committed to the research on transnational citizenship as an important part of our mandate. Thank you very much, Mizan, for joining us today. I'll now hand it over <coughs> to Professor Diaz Hassan. As I said, a sociologist guides a sociologist. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Mitra. Well, you've done an excellent job taking, uh, uh, doing the introduction, so I don't have to really do any more than, than that. I just wanted to make one observation when you were talking about it, uh, about, migra when do, uh, the, about migrants and the, and the problems of migration. Um, if you go back 500 years ago, I mean, I live in Australia, and I've lived in the United States, and uh, it's quite, I wonder what the Aboriginal people thought of the settlers when they came, what the American Indians thought. When I was a student at Ohio State, there used to be a radio program who used to begin, well, if the American Indian had a good immigration policy, it would be much better off than we are now at the moment. And I think there is an issue that, you know, when do migra migrants cease to be migrants? I mean, the great migrant countries uh, uh, of the modern world were actually are the very countries which are creating a lot of issues about migration itself. Anyway, uh, uh, just one uh, couple of observation. One, I'm very pleased to welcome, just add my welcome to Dr. Rahman. He is a, a product of a department of which I was a founder member, and I'm delighted that we have now such distinguished people coming uh, from the department. And secondly, I think he is a person who has demonstrated by his single-minded focus on a particular topic, migration, uh, that to achieve international recognition. And I'm sure that uh, many of you may know from his bio biographical note, the United Nations uh, uh, Migration, uh, International Organization for Migration, uh, um, is the most respected body in the world which actually deals with a lot of international migration issues. And uh, Mizanur Rahman is now member of the Migration Research Leaders Syndicate for 2018. And I'd like to congratulate him 
on this very distinguished and very worthwhile you. achievement. Thank and you very much. And the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Uh, Mitro and Prof. Riyaj Hassan. Uh, I am very much privileged to be here, and uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming for today's seminar. I am basically a researcher. I do research, and it's very straightforward. After publishing or doing particular research, I move to the second research, maybe sometimes the same night. So I published, uh, today's paper is based on a book that I published in April. This is my book. And after, uh, it's the third of April I published. And then I started working on my second book, which is uh, uh, Indian Diaspora Organization and Development in Education and Healthcare Sector in India. And uh, what happened when I moved from one book project to another book project? Usually, as a researcher, I forget what you wrote this project, because this is a completely different area. And today's presentation is based on this Bangladeshi migration. And maybe many of the things I may forget, please feel free to ask me questions. And if you need any elaboration or illustration, please let me know, OK? Uh, I, I like to see this uh, Bangladeshi migration to Singapore from South-South international migration perspective. This is not a single event. It is the migration from South global south to global north. And most of the studies look into the south migration for a migration from global south to global north. But what happens, there is a significant percentage or significant number of migrants going from south, global south to another global south countries. And we usually don't acknowledge that. And the way we put it is that it's all is south to North migration, which is not the case. Now, when there is a migration from south to north, the emphasis on the migration changes. In the global migration studies from the northern perspective, we'll see um, security issue is the main issue, and then uh, integration of the immigrants in the receiving country and remittances. But when we look at the same migration from south to south, our emphasis changes. We talk about migrants and their families, and what impacts this migration have on the migrant sending country and the society and community. And also, we see that uh, migrants' voices and uh, equality rights and other issues. So my presentation will be from that southern perspective that look into the migrants and migrant family rather than northern perspectives that focus on security and other issues. Um, if we look at the broader south to south migration, there's three key characteristics of whole migration pattern. One is it's regional in nature. For example, Southeast Asia, we have one region. Then we have GCC countries, which is Gulf Cooperation Council, Council countries. In Africa, we'll also find different regional migration. And also in the Latin American countries involving uh, Brazil mainly, there is a, a regional migration pattern also. So when we look at this South-South migration, this type of migration is temporary in nature. It is not permanent migration. People come in to work this another rich uh, rich countries in the south for temporary time frame, like few years, and go back home. This is the pattern. And then uh, it's mainly the individual migration. So if people talk about is it a family migration? No. We, uh, south countries, they invite individual migrants for work on a dif different categories for few years only. So Singapore as a south-south migration pattern within the south-south broader framework. Singapore is a country in Southeast Asia that home to around 1.6 million migrants. Migrants come in to work here for a few years, and then they back, go back home. It's a temporary migration punctuated by uh, back and forth journey for, for family care and asset building. And uh, this migration in Singapore, usually a worker, a migrant can stay 10 years. And if a migrant have different skills, we call it multiple skills. It's a bas ba very basic type of uh, trade courses. Then they can stay up to 22 years. It means that whole productive period of an individual can be 
uh, can be spent in Singapore. But this type of sophisticated migration policy will not be found in other countries. It's a very transparent policy that if you have this type of skills, you can stay up to 22 years, but depending on the availability of the job. Now, now uh, putting it into the theoretical framework, how migration scholars look at it. In the migration studies, we usually look at why people migrate. That's the huge literature on that, why people migrate. And, and uh, there is uh, three types of theories. First type of theory is structural theory. Second is uh, meso-level theories, and then micro-level theories. Uh, structural theories usually talk about uh, broader patterns of migration from developing country to developed country. And this uh, structural school fitted migration into different types of theorizations of underdevelopment, like dependency theory, center periphery theory, or world system theories. But problem with this uh, structural approach is that if we look at uh, the third world countries, uh, developing countries, if you go to the villages, if we study the households or migrant households, we find that actually these broader patterns can't explain why certain people from particular villages are migrating. So there are some built-in uh, structural drawbacks of these explanations. Then there are micro theories like uh, new classical economic theories that explain why people migrate from individual economic perspective. It is very simple. That is a wage differential between countries that lead to migration. They call it income maximizing strategy. There is another set of theory which is called new classical economic theories that explain individual from developing countries coming to developed countries because in the developing countries there are some vital markets that are imperfect, insufficient. For example, credit market, insurance market, future market. As a result, these households in the developing countries face income risk. So Families in these developing countries, they want to diversify risk. Uh, as a result, they send one or two members in the overseas market so that they can have a sustained flow of remittances from outside the country. So interesting is that this, the, the, this recent theory, new, new classical economic of theory, uh, 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 new economics of labor migration, this theory is the first time that link migration with motivation. That is the remittance that we are talking about today is actually not mentioned in the other theories. It is the new classical economic, new economics of labor migration theories that relate with remittances and migrant household in the developing countries. Now, all these three, I showed the three theory. The problem, I mentioned the new classical micro, micro and macro theories when people going from one country to another country in response to income or wage differences, there is a problem. Look at, for example, Bangladesh. There is a wage, the labor, uh, the salary and the Singapore salary is a different, right? Singapore, they can get more. But this whole Bangladesh, only a few places sending migrants to Singapore. For example, we, we have uh, more than, uh, more than six, uh, around 64 districts, but only a few districts from where migrants come into Singapore. If wage differential or income gap is the reason for migration, then all migrants are supposed to become from different parts of the Bangladesh, but come in only from a few districts. That explains why economic theories cannot explain this location space migration patterns. And the economic theories that see migrants as an individual economic actors cannot explain these differential migration rates. I argue that we need to look at the migrants as a social actors going beyond economic or utilitarian perspectives. And, uh, and uh, I also mentioned that uh, the risks to income that some theories suggest, but in real life, may, many migrants are taking migration decisions in a very precarious situation. So they don't know how much they will get when they will be working there, whether they will be cheated or not. They sell their own houses, land, and they take risk. So if it is risk minim minimizing a strategy, then they, should, they are not supposed to have take this type of risk. So 
the new economic stuff, labor migration, they talk about risk minimizing, but it seems to me the real life situation, actually they are taking risks. Uh, so I say that, look, if we look at social actors' perspective, uh, then uh, this, some of the problems that inherent in the economic theories will be solved. Now, I also mentioned that whole theories, mention, uh, unit of analysis is individual. It's an individual income maximizing strategy. The new economics of labor migration, they call that it is the family risk minimizing strategy, is migration. But I say, look, individual and family is definitely important unit of analysis for migration behavior and migration decision making. But in the many developing countries, there are other levels that we should consider. For the Bangladesh, it is the Bari. It's a, Bari is a, I'm going to show you what Bari is. But Bari, if we look at the whole migration from Bari perspective, then we can explain why migrants from a particular region come into Singapore or any other countries, and, and, uh, and uh, why they go back home, and how this uh, Bari patterns influence migration outcome as well. So now Bari is actually a collection of houses, a few houses. Uh, Bari is comprised of few houses, and usually it is blood related, what we call in South Asia lineage. It's mainly patrilinearly arranged households, and they're very blood relations. So sometimes our own brother may be staying far away from Bari, then relation will be different. But when they stay in the same, uh, same same places, I mean, uh, with the same, sharing the same court art, they have these different levels of relationship. For example, here we can see, left side, there are three households. It's one body. Here is uh, also three households, one body. Sometimes a four, five households or family comprise a body. Now, so members of the body have some responsibilities, like members of the family have responsibility to helping the juniors or the younger or elder brothers, sisters. The member of the body also help each other. If anyone lag behind in the body, it's the responsibility of other household members to help the body people. Now, in the migration studies, there are two processes that are studied. One is immigration process, proposed by Kassler Miller, world famous is the number one uh, to say uh, the field in the migration studies. He, he, he mentioned that immigration process, when migrants to go to live in a country, the way they settle in the process, settle in the receiving country, we should study that. And then there is a second set of concept that explain that how, a, how an immigrant coming from a developing country. So that is called becoming a migrant or emigrant, EMI, emigrant. So there is a two set of concepts. One is based on destination country, another one is based on host, uh, uh, sending country. But there is a no attempt to link these two concepts together to offer a holistic picture of migration process. So uh, I propose a concept which is migration as a social process. Combining immigration, means receiving country perspective, as well as sending country perspective. Uh, and I also say, look, the different points in the migration process, if we don't include these different points or spheres of migration, we will not get a complete picture of the whole migration process. To me, if I look at from Bangladesh to Singapore migration, first is motivation for migration, channeling migrants, how migrants come into, come into Singapore. Then when they arrive in Singapore, how they cope with the new places, very multicultural society. And then the social world, these migrants create when they are in Singapore. This is on process. And then when they're working here, they're also sending remittances back home. They're going back home every one or two years, stay with their family for a few weeks, few months, and then many of them come back. 
So we need to see this remittance process also. So if we combine these two processes, then it can offer a very holistic picture for the whole temporary migration patterns that we, that we find in the global south-south migration patterns. This is very complicated, but uh, this is the, actually the uh, more detailed version of the previous slide, this slide, okay? Uh, here I show that how migration is linked to families and the life in Singapore. Sh Singapore, someone going to Mustafa, taking picture, go, sending back home to the wife or father or mother. Uh, the whole process is linked, that's what I mean here. Research methodology. What happens in migration studies, people look at either destination country or sending country. But there is a little attempt. There is a, uh, hardly any research that look, that combine both countries and offer a holistic picture. So in my research methods, I use mixed methods. I used first two-way field work. Two-way field work means doing field work in Singapore and doing field work in Bangladesh. Mixed methods means it's a descriptive statistics as well as qualitative narratives of the migrants, so their wives, their family members, um, and sometimes recruiting agents. Multi-sided field work. I did not do field work only one place in Bangladesh, different places, and the same for Singapore. Multi-level also, I interviewed individual migrants, their families, their spouses, their parents, uh, and then the people who process their migration papers, different layers. Uh, I put it all these research methods in a, uh, in, a, in, a, in a diagram, but I already explained it, so I'm going to move to the next slide. So in my research, uh, in my presentation, I'm going to cover all the things that I show you, that migration in Singapore, so, uh, and then social importance of the migration in Bangladesh, how migrants come to Singapore, what are their social world in Singapore, the remittances, and then migration and family dynamics. Uh, migration policy in Singapore, uh, it's a very, I mean, this can be a single lecture, actually. So I'm not going to talk, uh, going, I'm not going to cover all these uh, headlines. But if you look at the whole immigration policy globally, actually, immigration was studied uh, uh, by sociologists, economists, but political scientists came quite later, and then they bring the state back, because state play a very important role by devising migration policy and bringing the potential migrants from different parts of the world. So nature of migration, immigration or migration policy is that some countries have demand-driven system, some country has supply-driven migration policy. For example, I should, uh, I should mention this, uh, I'm only, uh, uh, contribution for the sophistication of the migration policy in Singapore. Please have a look. So, so some countries have a very uh, policy that demand-driven, demand and some have supply-driven. These are two major policy shifts. So when we call it uh, supply-driven, it means that individual migrants from different parts of the world, they apply for immigration. And we use, for Canada, for example, using the human capital model, and Australia using new corporatist model. In this system, people apply for the immigration. Okay, then they go to the country, then they identify the job or find out the job, and then they uh, integrate in the labor market. But demand-driven system comes from the receiving country. They put demand for particular job, particular uh, occupations. Then it comes through a different channels, right, recruitment agents. So then they, they identify the right people. Then the right people go to the receiving country and work in those particular jobs. So Singapore and most of the southern countries, they follow demand-driven system. But country, classical immigrant countries like Australia, New Zealand, Canada, they follow supply-driven system. Now, in, in Singapore population, if we want to look at the Singapore population, there are two types of mainly population. One is resident population, and other one is a non-resident population. Resident population means citizen and peer. Non-resident -re population means uh, who are here working or visiting, they are called non-resident population. 
And there are also sizable Singaporeans who are living outside Singapore. We, I call them overseas Singaporeans, uh, which is all more, uh, more than 200,000 at this moment. So non-resident foreigners are invited to Singapore for live and work, and the number is almost uh, 1.7 million at this point, uh, at this moment. So uh, my, the policy I am going to discuss later will actually cover only this non-resident population, the non-resident foreigners. Uh, among the non-resident foreigners, there are different groups, like students, employment pass, S pass, work permit, domestic workers, dependents. Now, question may be, why you put student pass here? Because student pass, student come here, and after education here, and knowing the Singapore society culture, they are prepared for the labor market. So they, they, there is a channel in for educational, remote, educational way, they channel to the labor market also. That's why I put it here. Hmm? Uh, these are the some salient features of education uh, immigration policy in Singapore fast controlling demand. Everyone wants to come to Singapore, right? But there is a way to control the demand. And then transience and disposability. All non-resident population is for temporary reason. And when economy is doing, uh, uh, yeah, well, economy is OK and uh, can absorb foreigners, then they, uh, they hire. If they cannot, then they go back home. Gendered migration policy. Migration policy is also gendered. It's ethnicized. It's educationally channeled. And and immigration is linked to population policy as well, because many of the professionals become peer and become citizen later. Now, this is the pathway. When people come as EP or SPAS holders, when people come as skilled and professionals, they have a pathway. They, a smaller number of them can become permanent residents, and then a smaller number can be, become also citizen in Singapore. Uh, it's like this, employment pass, then uh, Singapore permanent resident or Singapore citizens, and many actually don't take up citizenship. They apply for extension of their job, and they work here. After a few years, they go back home or other countries. This is for the skill groups. But non-skill groups, they have their other categories. Non-skill, excuse me. <coughs> non-skill group or semi-skill groups will be temporary and circular in nature and permanently transient. Permanently temporary to some extent, because in Europe we use the term this uh, permanently temporary. It means that they are temporary, but they are permanent feature. They, they, they will be here because they are going back home, coming back home, and, and, and this kind of Singapore needs foreign workers. So they manage the foreign workers as a temporary phenomenon. Singapore migration policy, if you look at the uh, migration policy in global south, like GCC countries, and as well as the East Asia, like Korea, Japan, and other countries in the Southeast Asia, we'll find that Singapore migration policy is very transparent, sophisticated, is tied to the labor market need, and they set an example for other southern countries that hire, that rely on foreigners, they can, they can ex replicate or they can follow the Singapore migration policy for the management of the foreigners. Now, question is why people come from Bangladesh to Singapore? <coughs> to understand the motivation for migration, I emphasize the social organization of the Bangladeshi society. We need to know how society is organized in rural Bangladesh. Uh, this is the group of the people at the different level. First, uh, first example, we talk about family. Then, we, uh, then there is a second layer, is Bari, which is collection of families. Then Para, which is neighborhood. Then social union, which is administrative unit. And then uh, Pana and the district. Actually, uh, it's very a bit complicated here, because so, so it's quite long also. Let's look at this feature. So family first, then bigger is uh, Bari, then bigger is Para, then uh, slowly going ascending order. The district is a British system. So, I am talking about the Bari, uh, family and Bari, but not the neighborhood or uh, other things. But there's a different layers and different types of relationships. And people in the society reconfigure or reposition themselves in the social hierarchy on the basis of the people who know each other and their repetition. Now, claiming social status. In the traditional society, 
if someone claim their status, they usually use their land and their lineage. Why, what is your father doing? Or what, what is your caste, which is called lineage? But this traditional, traditional tools for claiming social status has been challenged because of the migration. Migration give access to the resources that reconfigure their position in the society give the higher positions in the society. As a result, migration has generated status communities in the village societies. Village means uh, para and the, uh, uh, and the union levels. Uh, yeah, village uh, unions up to the union levels, and sometimes even a few uh, upajilas. Uh, now, i like to introduce a geographical concept of geographical uh, imagination. We know what is geographical imagination. Geographical imagination refers to a way of thinking about the world and considering the relative importance of places between my place and other place. This relative importance, importance is relative, that my place is not superior, but other place is superior. This, this fleeing of superiority on the basis of geographical imagination is captured in the Bangladeshi mind. We people in the Bangladesh, they call it Bidesh, which means overseas, overseas or abroad. And Desh means my country, my village, my para, my body. So this geographical imagination and the relative importance Set and set set appeal. It's fire. It sparks the interest that I need to go somewhere else to claim to to show my position in the society. Now, I don't want to build further here, but I'm going to develop other concept on the basis of this relative importance, from relative importance to relative status. In the whole migration literature, uh, it's a th completely theoretical discussions. When we look, explain why people migrate, there are two set of theories. Initiation of migration, and another one is perpetuation of migration. Why migration perpetuate? And theorists, when they explain why people migrate from another one country to another country, sociologists use the destination in factors, who is his social or social capital or, or migrant networks. We, we tell people, we explain that in Singapore, he has the relatives, that's why someone going to Singapore. Someone going to Canada because his father, mother, or sister, or neighborhood, someone living in Canada. So that's why from South Asia, he's going to Canada. That's the role of the networks, because people going to Canada because they have the relatives. And once you have the relatives, it will, you, will, it, you will find it very easy to adapt to the society. So we call it destination in factor for explaining the causes of migration. And this is the sociological explanation. And economists, they, 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 they look at sending and receiving country. For the sending country, they have their own variables, their own concepts to explain why people from South Asia going to Canada or why people from Bangladesh come into Singapore. They use two variables or two concepts. One is income differences. Second is relative deprivation. People come in from Bangladesh to Singapore because wages is higher. People come in from Bangladesh to Singapore because one people is poor or relatively poor than other. So this relative poor poverty or relative deprivation causes migration. Now, for the sending it factor, we have economic concepts. For the receiving in factor, we have sociological concept. But there is a no sociological concepts explaining the causes of migration from sending country. So I introduce a concept which is called relative status to explain the causes of migration from sending in factor. Now, relative status means the people changes in the status because of some access to the resources. And as a result, people want to acquire the status in the society relative to other person in the society. How it works? You see, the houses. One house is uh, brick, another one is not brick. A small, 
one house is big, another one is big. This is just a demonstration effect, but there is more about that. Okay, I, I, I interviewed 50 bodies to explain that how relative pressure stress works. So this is details, I'm going, uh, I may not cover it, so I'm not going to details talk about it. Look at this body number one. In body number one, in my uh, interviews in the field work, there are three families in body number one, but non-migrant families is no. These three, these three families in this body, all of them sent members. How many members? Five members sent to different countries. Saudi Arabia, South Korea, South Saudi Arabia, Singapore, and Italy. So one body, they have three, three families, three families sending five members and to different countries. Now, in the people mindset, they, they know that the country like Saudi Arabia is a purely labor migrant. But country in South Korea, in the people, my imagination, it's very higher status. They think, oh, South Korea is a very good country. People living in Singapore, very good country. People living in Italy, very good country. So at the body level, where the migrants are working, it also set a route, it also make a, a status claim to like, hey, look, your, your, your member is living in Saudi Arabia, my brother is living in Italy or Singapore. If you look at the second case, there's a no, two no, there is a one on migrant family, two non migrant families. One migrant family sent two members to Singapore. Now it does not mean that now one migrant and these two migrant families will not send members to Singapore. They will send slowly because when this migrant family send members to Singapore, these non migrant families feel social pressure because their status in the society reduced because they cannot claim status. They will say if they work in the village, oh, my member is working in uh, Canada or Singapore. So there is a higher status in the society. Whole social structure, that configuration changes. As a result, there is a relative deprivation that causes pupil to go to particular, to other country. And now depending on the resources, they choose the country. So all these examples showing this body, for example, uh, body number 25, three people, uh, three families have migrants, one family don't have. You see the, the balance. Four families in a body, three families already send members, four members on body, one family could not, and they actually don't feel good. They, I don't have any on in other countries. So that relative position in the social hierarchy provokes migration. Now, 50, migra uh, 50 bodies I interviewed. If you look at the different countries, like Singapore, from 50 bodies, 90 members working in Singapore. So there are we have 17 members from these 50 migrant bodies. Malaysia, five members. South Korea, Italy, nine. So you can see that ha a a f even a family is multi-locals. They have members in different countries. And body, also the multi-locals, they have different members in the different countries. Okay, this uh, cultural notion of work, cultural notion of work means that once you go versus you have a status in the society. So you cannot do the work that non-migrants are doing. It's like uh, uh, once you have the higher status, you cannot downgrade yourself. Channel in Bangladeshi migration to Singapore. Uh, usually we look at migrant in institutions like recruiting agencies, how do they bring, but actually it's not only the recruiting agents, it's also the social network. So two things work. One is migrant networks, and the second layer is the migrant institutions. We call it the two, two, two engines of migration. Two engines because they, they fuel the migration. So it's both way it works. It, it, both are relevant for all temporary form of migration in the global south. Uh, so many of the points I'm, not go I'm going to uh, talk about only few. Huh? Uh, this is the structure. This is Singapore. This is Bangladesh. People come in from Bangladesh to Singapore. It's the recruiting agents, but with the recruiting agents, so these migrant networks uh, also play a very important role. Uh, cost of migration, you know, uh, I'm, I'm giving you some body data, body number one, number five, have total migrants in the body five, and you see different countries they go, and as a result, their 
migration cost is also different. For Saudi Arabia, they use $3,000. They come to South Korea, $13,000 US dollar. They come to Saudi Arabia, $3,000. Migrants come into Singapore, they spend $6,000. One migrant who went to Italy, they spend $21,000. Now, how, why this differential cost? Because when a migrant go to Italy, it is a permanent migration. It, it gives the access to their family members also. So it's a joint project, and the family and body members, they contribute, because this is a permanent form of migration. And, and the temporary form of migration is less expensive because that's a temporary form of migration. They have to go back home. Uh, we, uh, we, uh, we, we talk about uh, migrant institutions, but we don't talk about reciprocity. Reciprocity means when we do something, you have to do me the same thing, favor. If you look at and how this process, that is reciprocity, generate migration. I'm going to show you a table of 12 uh, migrants who, whom I interviewed in Singapore. They, they in total helped, unfortunately this data is little, this uh, 12 migrants, they help financially more than 100 migrant workers. And from information, they provided more than 200 migrant workers. So only 12 migrants helped more than 100 migrants financially to come to Singapore. So, so we can see that how reciprocity and these people who came to Singapore with the help of some people, they have the moral responsibility to help other migrants financially also, and also through information sharing. So this way, migrants, migration become a self-feeding process. It's self-feeding. Because one help, two, then it's, it's keep on increasing. Social also of migrants in Singapore. Right. There are many issues, uh, work, uh, working conditions, living situations, medical care, migrant poetry, champion of uh, our director, migrant for trust organizations, and religious life. Migra uh, working conditions, so there is a set of rules and regulations that is followed, how many hours you can work after, after working that hour, you can have a overtime payment. The living situations, migrants live in dormitories, migrants live in HDV flats, migrants also live in the work sites. There is a rule that the, there's a minimal living spaces have to be provided and this, those rules are inspected and implemented usually. Medical care, before come, uh, there's a two, uh, two, uh, two phase of screening. Before coming to Singapore, they need to go for some test in Bangladesh. Once they come here, they need to go for test again. Once they pass this test, then they will be given work permit, and then it will be the responsibility of employer to take care of the health of migrants in Singapore. And there is the ins compulsory insurance, which is uh, over $15,000, that will be uh, uh, paid, premiums will be paid by the employer. The migrant, uh, migrant poetry, migrants write poetry, there's poetry competition, and ISAS is the champion of it. The migrant focused organizations, the government have a department that, uh, that, uh, that look after the all migrants issues. In addition to government department, there is a few migrant organizations. They want to, they also take care of the well-being of the migrants. There is a Bangladeshi association. They organize blood donation, cricket mass, and uh, religious uh, dinner. So this type of uh, community integration process we find. Then religious life, which is very sensitive. Um, I have to mention this name of the NGOs. Eh? There, there, uh, there are a few. Now, uh, migrants are mostly Muslims and Hindus. We have also, they live together and they don't discriminate that uh, I am Hindu, I am Muslim. No, it's not like that. They, it's very difficult to find out wh who is Muslim and who, in, who is Hindu because they, they're sleeping together, the same house, they're eating together. They, uh, they, it's a very natural relationship like in Bangladesh. It's a different completely from other countries. And uh, Muslims migrants, they go for the pray, who wants to pray. Now, a very important point is that the migrants were coming here mainly 20 to 40, 45 years of old. Actually, this age cohort also in Bangladesh don't go many go to the mosque. It is the after 50 when they are very semesters, they mostly they go. But it does not mean that in Bangladesh they don't go, they go. But this this age group, this age cohort, the number is actually in Bangladesh also quite low. 
But, uh, and they five times pray in the mosque is not compulsory, right? They can pray at home also. They, mostly here they don't go mosque, they pray at home. And we have a Eid al-Fitr and Eid al-Ajha to Muslim uh, festivals. Uh, during these festivals in Singapore, there are some mosques where uh, there is a Bengali mus uh, imams who pray and also uh, Salem, uh, I mean, who's called it Khutbah in, uh, in Bengali. And uh, people come and uh, meet with their friends on these two events. For the Hindu migrants, they have a Durga Puja because in Bengal it's famous for Durga Puja. And uh, we organize together, we go, um, Hindu Muslims all go and celebrate together. And the embassy, uh, special high commission take uh, special interest in, in, uh, in, in both religious events. Now, in, in Singapore, there is a Tablik Jamaat. And now Tablik Jamaat, I like to mention, because Tablik Jamaat have the capacity to change people's mind. If you look at the, uh, the six characteristics of Tablik Jamaat, the last theory I mentioned is actually a little bit, uh, they promote uh, the sp uh, spread of the religion, and also they promote isolation from non-Muslims. So, uh, and that's quite common among the migrants. Many migrants go for the Tablik Jamaat, and Tablik Jamaat is quite popular in Singapore. Uh, but the, still, so, there are some mosques that, 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 that don't promote the Tablik Jamaat. But uh, overall, when there is holiday, people go for Tablik Jamaat. Uh, and uh, I, I mentioned Tablik Jamaat because I find that it's really sometimes uh, uh, they, they, may, they, they may be threatening uh, for the security. Uh, uh, there is a talk about this political Islam. So if you ask me a question, I'll answer because I cannot cover all that I got the five minutes note. Remittances as a social process. When we talk about remittances, we talk about number. How much money, whom, who's sending. But remittance is a social process, and I identify this social process in terms of remittance transfer, remittance sending, remittance receiving, and remittance control and use. If you look at this diagram, from Singapore, people sending money. There is a two way to send money. Through formal means, like Western Union, MoneyGram, banks. And there is the other way, which is called Hundi. It's an informal way based on social relationship. So I want to send money from here to my house in some island in Bangladesh. If I know some people, I can send, and that money will be transferred to my wife or my, my relatives, whomever I want. So there, and this is very reliable. There was a time when almost 99% was sending money through remittances, but after 9-11, increasing securitization of remittances. People now sending more money through the formal channel. And this is the whole uh, social process of remittances I try to capture through this diagram. Now, how much they earn in Singapore? As, uh, I'm getting this 250 migrants uh, uh, on average earnings, which is the uh, mean earning is uh, $1,000, monthly saving is uh, $754. Remittances, they're sending the last transfer was 659, 759. Last transfer because they don't remit every month, so that's why I put the last, uh, last transfer. Now, whom they're sending? Male migrants supposed to send whom? They sometimes they send their parents, which is mainly father, wives, brothers, sisters, and other relatives. We will see that 83% sending to their parents, uh, and 62% uh, actually, in the, uh, on average. Because I interview in Singapore, I interview in the back home. And I ask whom, whom they send the remittances and who received the remittances. We see the vendor differentiated pattern of remittance sending. So mainly their sending is still to their male members. Male members, and they keep on changing. Sometimes they send elder brother and elder brother not g giving the money, spending the money wisely. So they send, they change the recipient of the remittances. In this, in this uh, survey, it's a male migrant, 76% receiving remittances, female migrants, 24 To me, who receive money is very important because person who is receive money is trusted. And that is going to have impact in the family development dynamics. In my interview of on zero four families in Bangladesh in 2004, I found that uh, male recipient was 42 percent and fem uh, 42 mem members. Female was 62. Female was higher because in this re region, it is the informal remittances 
transfer, which is called locally hundi, was very prevalent, very, very widespread. That's why the female number went higher. Now, when we send money by formal banks, formal means, we need to send someone who have a bank account in Bangladesh. Now, here is mainly male migrants, right? 99% of Bangladeshi male migrants working here. If they want to send their wife in back home, wife may not have account, wife may not be allowed to go to the city bank and may need to go few times. And all this have some cultural implications. Sometimes some, some, some parents don't want it. And sometimes some parents don't want that the money should be sent to wife, why not to father? As a result, the previous survey in Singapore was different, but in when I surveyed the household, they told me that no, um, wife is getting the money because this is informal channel. So when we promote formal channel of remittances, we need to understand the cultural dynamics back home because culturally it is not acceptable to go sometimes some wives, some sisters to city to collect money, go to the bank few times. There, there are some cultural bar barriers for formal remittance channels. Ma now migration and family dynamics. Uh, the many issues to cover, but uh, let's uh, cover only a few, then I will finish. Uh, here I am uh, providing the cases of the migrant uh, uh, remittances used by the migrant family and non-migrant family. What is the, their main source of income in the migrant family? What are the main source of income in the non-migrant families? If we look at this migrant families, remittances, 93. If you look, look at the non-migrant families, it's agriculture, small businesses, employment, rents of houses, all kinds of things. Remittances, not a theory, agriculture. So what happens? People are relying more on remittances than local means of income generation. Right? If you look at this table, if you analyze it, we can say that migrant families relying on remittances, which is called remittance symptom or many, uh, many other concepts, which is very fake to me also sometimes. But non-migrant families have a local means of income generation. Now, uh, I'm going to explain this why, and why I don't agree with it. I, I'm, I'm, going, uh, I'm going to show some other slides. Let's have a look on the food education and medical care in the migrant families. The remittances are used in the medical care because the health insurance is not common, but we have the government hospitals also, but still migrants, when they overseas, their parents, their relatives expect they will get a private medical care. So many, uh, a good portion of the remittances is used also for medical care, food intake 100%. The people, the interviewed, they use money remittances for food and the education. Education is uh, 59 because uh, some families had no children is small, so that's right. Now, all this use of the remittance say what? Economists will say, no, they are, not, they are not contributing to income generation, right? But to me, they are contributing to a human capital formation. So if we look at the role of remittances, we can say, okay, not physical capital formation, but there is a the, uh, there's high percentage of remittances used in the human capital formation, which is also very important. Uh, migrant households, there is a display of the fo foreign goods at the migrant households and leading to the um, uh, increasing relative status in the families. If you look at the migrant households, they have more um, uh, family uh, uh, foreign goods and the other uh, status tools. Non-migrant families, they don't afford to do that. Another dimension I want to mention that marriage. Marriage pattern change. A migrant family and non-migrant families, uh, mig migrant families will see that uh, during my interview, 93 marriages took place, 39 migrant families, four only non-migrant families. Non-migrant non families was 61, migrant families on, on zero four. It means that marriageability increases in the migrant families. Now, marriage, the development has a different meaning to the different people. If you look at the Bangladeshi society, marrying of elder sister, junior or younger sister is development for the brother because he is executing his role. So the, the, the whole debate, what is development, is question. So for the migrants, a migrant is able to marry off his sister or brother, that's a development for him. In Africa, 
they want to get rid of witchcraft. So that is the development for Africa. Empowerment, we always talk about empowerment of women, so, but men also important because when, if men stay at home, they need to follow the parents. It's a patriarchal society. When they come to Singapore, they have money, they, their voices are heard, their voices are honored. So they are also important. It's not only the male, also female back home are important because of their emergencies. That's all. Thank you so much. Well, I'm sure you've, uh, Ms. Anj, you have given a huge amount of information. I'm sure that there will be a lot of questions. And let me just, while people are, uh, we, we have about 20 minutes, uh, but bef while people are f of, you know, formulating the question, let me just make uh, one or two observations. And maybe you don't have to respond to them now, but if you have time. In, um, you basically, uh, the two theories, the uh, you have the neoclassical uh, labor theory and then you have the uh, neoeconomics labor migration theory. Uh, the neoclassical theory was essentially is the, to maximize the lifetime earning and uh, people migrate in order to, to just maximize the lifetime earning and, and if they came home it was kind of failure in that. The new labor market is just basically a temporary failure in the labor market, and then people move, and when they get things get better, they come back. So there is a, a lot of stigma attached in, it was related to, I don't know whether this is still applies or not. In one other observation that you, you made, uh, I, I was, in previous studies just came to my mind. Uh, when relative help their relatives to migrate, uh, some of the research shows that they tend to be more exploitative yeah. than the actually non-relatives are. They in fact, and certainly that is the, the, the observation that are findings of studies of the Middle Eastern migration, from South, uh, uh, South Asian migration to Middle East. Uh, now, the recipients, yes. when it's a male recipient, uh, the previous research at least from okay. the Middle East has shown and some of it's your own work, yeah is that when male recipients, they tend to spend money mostly on, on um, um, yeah. uh, events yeah. on unrelated to health and education. Okay. When female receive money, they tend to spend more money on male okay. and female, on, on education and health. Okay. So in a way, there is a difference in terms of who receives the money and yeah. how yeah. much benefit that money then uh, relates to or conveys to the family. No, I'm just wondering, I'm yeah. you don't have to uh, uh, answer uh, now, but... Uh, maybe maybe I, I didn't show this point, I should mention it. Why a millionaire, when, uh, when an ordinary person win a lottery, and if you look at this uh, million dollar winners, we'll find that many of them ended up again poverty. Why? Because poor people can't afford to say no. Poor people in the developing societies have to say yes to their relatives because they want to have rich in social capital. They, they, they can't afford to say no because they are rich in social capital. Social capital provide their life support when they need it. Rich people can afford to say no to their relatives because they, they are not dependent on but poor people dependent. And that's the other side of social capital. The point you mentioned, why relatives pay and why relatives exploit? Because all are in a setting of developing societies. They rely on the resources of the relatives because they don't have market, like insurance market, credit card market, so need to rely on the relatives. As a result, they can't say no, and they will be benefited by that. This is the downside of the social capital, which I could not answer. Okay. Okay. Well, Please. open, Professor Mitra. <coughs> Let, let's have other people who want to. Any other any other questions? Right. Go. Yes, please. Thank you uh, for please. a truly fascinating talk. I say this for a very particular reason. We are all victims of globalization today in the sense that globalization holds up the opportunity of everlasting happiness as if there is no tomorrow to worry about. And yet, when you look at Europe today, mi migrants are seen 
as a threat. Globalization strictly works on the basis of the individual as the unit of analysis and the migrant as so much labor power. Or in other words, yes, it would be a parity optimal situation in the global market for migration if you didn't have a desh, a body, or a family, if you are just an individual. There's a need for you here today, you come, and tomorrow there is no need, you go. And there's no question of thinking about the other thing that you take into account in making your own decision. What I find fascinating, and this is exactly what I expect from a sociologist to respond to the economist, to the neoclassical theory, is that the migrant is not just so much labor power for hire, but a human being. Now, that is the opening of the argument, and I would like to go from there to ask you what is really new in your findings. Because that's the claim you make in this lecture, yeah. that you're offering something <coughs> novel. Yeah. So in terms of policy, I'll just complete it. In terms of policy, Hawala, it is uh, the Indian word, Hundi is the Bangladeshi word, is a method of money transfer, for example. Or the moral obligation of the brotheri or the family to invest in sending someone out to Italy so that he would help the rest of the migrants. Now, these are your findings, but what kind of policies should Singapore or India as a state adopt from it? Is Hundi a good thing or a bad thing? The mosque, is it a place for prayer or conspiracy? Now, these are the novelties of your finding I want you to develop on it to tell me, for example, choose any state that you are familiar with, Bangladesh, Singapore, or India, and go to the next step and show what are the new policy implications of your findings for the state. Okay, thank you. Would you, would you uh, you'd like to go ahead and ask yeah, questions? Some more questions? Could you introduce yourself? Thank you. Thank you. My, uh, my name is Anisil Hawk, and uh, I'm the Deputy Chief of Mission from Bangladesh High Commission. Uh, and I'll be following from the question that Professor Riyaj Hassan, you asked at the beginning, to Dr. Minjur Rahman. And uh, possibly I'll be a bit uh, direct to ask uh, the question whether you feel whether uh, the exploitation itself has a role in migration, because I remember you mentioned uh, differential income has got a big role in migration, while my own experience in uh, Malaysia and Singapore, what we feel that there is a good percentage of the migrant workers coming from Bangladesh, they are coming just because of pure exploitation and exploitation at different level. Possibly I won't define it, you possibly know it better. Mm. Uh, number two, uh, the, the other po point that you mentioned that possibly uh, coming to Singapore is less costly than going to uh, Singapore, um, Italy, and whether we are putting two different, um, we are making a, a, a comparison which is not, I mean, justified. Um, our experience from the, I'm, I'm talking from the embassy points of view, it shows that uh, countries like Singapore and countries like migration in countries like uh, Italy are completely different and we cannot actually put both in the same basket given that going to um, north mostly it's more like skill migration mm. while coming to south south which you mentioned is a purely unskilled migration and there is very small percentage of skill migration but mostly unskilled migration okay. and as as actually we we see we make a difference between skill migration and um, non skill migration as well as uh, documented migration, I will use documented migration rather than illegal migration, and undocumented migration. The undocumented migration uh, costs a lot more. That's why, you know, countries like Italy, where legal migration is very less, it costs much more than migrating to Singapore. Okay. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, th uh, thank you very much uh, for your ask asking this very important question. Exploitation, uh, I mean, uh, there's a very big concept uh, to discuss here. You know, I, it's true that some people are cheated. I will say cheated. 
systematic exploitation, the exploitation the way we understand sociologically is uh, different from the way we regularly use in everyday talk. Uh, I mentioned that it's a south-south migration. It's not south-north migration. In the south-south migration, everywhere, every south-south migration systems, including Africa, Latin America, and the Middle East, migration destinations. We find that some people are benefited, make money out of migrants. And it goes from down to the blaze to the capital city and then foreign capital city or whatever. So uh, I mean, it's the part of the process because we are dealing with semi-skilled rural mainly migrants who does not know the whole process and make there are some interest uh, people who uh, who want to make money out of this so that's uh, something else i do, i mean we need uh, maybe personal discussions how to, why it's happening and how long and how we can control it then uh, for main the point that south south migration is skill migration not a major component uh, and South North is a major component. That's a very problematic because to me, South South migration, if you talk about even in Asia, Asia migration is more than 56 million migrants in Asia. And every year, one and a half million migrants moving from one Asia country to another Asian country. So it's a huge population, and there's huge skill migrants living in these countries in the whole South migration. North migration is an immigration going to these countries from global South and global North. For example, in Canada, people come in from not only global South, many people come in from even global North. And they come on the basis of skill category. They are the prescribed skill category. And there are very few people. And by by filtering out, by, by, by taking them from the developing south to north, we are, we are creating a system which is called brain drain. But when a migration takes place within south-south, it's not brain drain, because these migrants keep in constant relation with their back back home, sending money to their families back home, sending country, sending villages, sending Bali, Sending body, sending individual are benefited in the migration. We call it win-win situation. But I understand and appreciate the position that there is a many, many malpractices. Yes, global south is has many, uh, many of the drawbacks, inherent drawbacks, and those drawbacks we cannot all, only tell it is the re receiving country, but in the sending countries in the global south also have problems. They, they. There, there are very many interested um, uh, this profit making groups there. Uh, migration cost. I mentioned that this is my body level survey data, and I show that this Italy going to pupil they spend uh, that much, and Korea spend that much. It's the different uh, things. I mean, uh, uh, I did not talk about Italy or Korea today, but uh, when I did the field work in Korea, in Italy, we know only a few hundred people going legally as agricultural workers in Italy, but many more. Thousands of people go into Italy through different channels. Uh, you know, because you're working, you know that uh, we have the Russia, that channel, Poland, we have the African different channels, and they spend a lot of money. And whole social process of cross-border migration. There can be a different project that how a migrant living in rural villages connect to the people in Italy and sending money in the different phase of their migration and eventually successful getting access in Italy. You'd like to address Professor Mitra's question? What is uh, new about uh, uh, As a migration scholar, as a social scientist, I study this, I describe the pattern, I study, explain why it's happening. I don't go for the prescription for the national states. That's the policymakers usually do it. But if policymakers want to draw conclusions, they can use my research. And usually when policymaking or action research we call, or prescription research we call. They use descriptive research and explanatory research to draw their policy. I don't do that. I just describe and explain as an academic research. But policymakers can do that. I mean, they can use my data. I am not going to uh, uh, push my 
findings to policy making. But there are many, 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 many things that policymakers will find in my paper. For example, Hundi, we call it securitization of migration. But when we have this securitization of migration, a state benefited because remittance go in from formal channel. But the immigrant migrant family who sold their land to go to Italy, from Italy as illegal migrants cannot remit money back home. They're sending money through an informal channel. So that is the human dimension, and we need to understand it. We need to appreciate it when we, when we formulate or when we come up with the policy. But I like to leave it to the political scientists. And, uh, and the uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, well, the main purpose of my intervention is to congratulate you, Ms. An, on, on an extremely, extremely well detailed, if there is such a word, uh, paper. Uh, you spoke of uh, uh, the kind of data feeding you did to policymakers. With that, in that regard, I can say that I, for one, found your work extremely useful. And you know that during our period in office, we sent out 1.8 million workers, contractual labor, to various countries of the world. Uh, your analysis is, of course, relevant from, from the time when the, uh, the state got involved in, in, in migration policy. In Bangladesh, of course, I just wanted to flag one point. There were huge migrations even before state became um, uh, uh, involved. Yeah. And part of it was exploitation, but it was the feudal exploitation by the landlords of the peasantry. You, of course, leave out for obvious reasons. A huge chunk of migration took place to the United Kingdom, what is England. And all the uh, people from Sillet who went to England went because they were peasants. It did not add to their social status at home, by the way, uh, unlike the migrant to Saudi Arabia and Singapore. Those who went to England went, uh, were identified as peasants and riots in, their, in the sending state, in, in Silat, that is. Now, when they go, they, are, they were encouraged to settle down in the, in the receiving state. Today, today we have, for instance, from that community, three members of parliament from London. In, in, in the House of Commons. But we don't depend on them uh, for uh, remittances because you know they have three generations, four generations living in England and America, and they don't send money home as those in Saudi Arabia and the UAE do. But they are useful to the sending community in another way because they help sh uh, shape the fashion in the receiving, policy in the receiving state in a way that is favorable exactly. to the sending state. Exactly. So that's exactly. another set of benefits yeah. that accrues exactly. to the sending state, exactly. which is not, you know, which cannot yeah. be calculated in terms of yeah. remittances. So exactly. I just wanted to flag this point that yes. migration has many dimensions. Yeah, 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 yeah. exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That's a very good point. Thank you, Prof. I just wanted to make one observation. We uh, did some work in, Abu da in, in UAE. And we found that uh, one of the best places to get information about uh, exploitation and labor condition was actually go to the labor attache of the, of the embassies of India, Bangladesh, and Pakistan, uh, and find out from them. And we were appalled the kind of uh, conditions, in particularly people in prison, that they I remember talking to one labor attache in, uh, in, in Abu Dhabi and, and asked, he, he said, oh, I'm sorry, I have to go. I said, where are you going? I'm going to the prison. I thought he was going to the prison. He said, no, I have 41 people I have to interview because they have been actually in prison uh, because of the, um, the uh, for violating the rules. And the rules were that they had signed a, a, f a blank paper when they arrived that this is the amount of money they have that amount of money they had paid to the kafil. And when they wanted to go home, because they, they were not very happy, the kafil said, you owe me $5,000, $50,000, or whatever it was. And they never actually mentioned it, because they signed a blank paper. And I mean, this is just one example. And I'm sure you, uh, Ms. Anur has done so much work in that area. But it's a, a very interesting area to actually get a picture of, uh, of what if you're looking at exploitation and problems of migration. There's one aspect, you know, there is a, um, uh, Mizan, Bangla what is the average age in which people come to from Bangladesh? Uh, um, it's uh, actually, age is a very complicated because they don't have the birth certificate. Yeah, so maybe, uh, yeah, 25 to 35. Yeah. You see, so and if you look come at, in yeah. 
And these are, if you look at the avoided cost of education, this is the society has invested in these people, a lot of money. And I just wonder how much of that, you know, the money that they're making here is actually compensating the society for investing in money that they, the society has invested in them. Uh, we, we did some research in Australia and we found that Australia's aid to uh, some of the Asian countries actually was less than what the Asian countries were con contributing to Australia uh, through migration because the avoided cost of education for Australia ran into millions of dollars. No, any other questions, comments? Yeah. Yes, uh, please, two, yeah. yes, please. Mm -hmm. Depend it and then use. Okay, yeah, go. Here at the same university, right? Yeah. Yes, we are uh, So yeah. I, I'm later labor at the gym. Uh, I I see just uh, some uh, points could have been incorporated, or just uh, your idea on that the social cost of okay. uh, economic yes. cost, mm. and actually is is it anyway benefited? We are sending uh, quite solely uh, relying on the <coughs> balance of payment setting off with the remittance money. Exactly. Uh, but with the raising cost of yes. mm, maybe 1.8 million in SARS period with contractual temporary basis up to 20, 25 years yeah, exactly. mm, uh, with, with the labor uh, time with their mother. Mm. So mm. Uh, if, if it was beneficial in that way, then Philippines, including my one, would got this. The, and people are uh, going to different countries, mm. uh, living 10, 20 years, mm. um, got oriented with the culture, coming back, um, and uh, they are uh, failing to match with this one. Saudi mocks, maybe Kuwaiti mocks, uh, different. Um, uh, so there's the social dimension getting changed. Mm, uh, so all these things, uh, can you? come up with a policy suggestion, which you might not do it, but still, you know, <laughs> no, your, okay. your idea, yeah, you know, I, I how it. long when a country uh, could continue um, offsetting his balance of okay. payment on yeah. remittance, how wise it is yeah, in the history of human civilization. Of course, we move, migrate, uh, uh, nobody can change, and uh, migration and people of helping migrating from the conflict zone is a big business. Uh, especially this year and a few uh, more years to come. Just uh, okay. your policy suggestion to us. Let's have thank, to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. You have a question and then we will conclude with the death. These are the last two observations. Uh, thank you. Ms. Nur, fascinating data set. There's so much you can do with that. I can see clearly. A couple of clarifications. So I come from, a, I'll deliberately take a very reductionist perspective as an economist. Uh, your unit of analysis is the Bari. I'm assuming yeah. is that an equivalent to a village? The Bari? Home, home. home, okay. So there's... A, a collection of homes. A collection of homes, and they're bound together by ethnic or some sort of a kinship yeah. tie. Yeah, yes, yes. Am yeah. I right? It's, okay. a, it's a patriarchal, usually. Okay, but pa that's the broader. Yeah, the patri patriarchal pa is, sorry, sorry, that's pa universal. Patrilineally right? formed, usually. But that's, again, a universal trait. Pa no, no, Bari is patrilineally, patrilineally oh, Bari. I see. okay. Yeah, okay. patrilineally means father side. Yeah? I see. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So are, are, the, are, the, are the Baris, I mean, can they, does the data allow you to differentiate according to class or some kind of socioeconomic group? Um, what I have at the back of mind is, for instance, Silet. Yes. Uh, supplies a huge number of sous chefs across the world, literally today, and very skilled ones. I mean, if they're not up to Michelin star, but uh, most of the South Asian restaurants, I mean, the experts tend to be from uh, uh, that area. How do the social ties play up in other sectors? The other question is, I'm a bit surprised at, um, you know, the re who gets the repatriated funds? So within your data set, uh, in the case of married people going abroad, it's still mama and papa who are getting the money back home, and why not the spouse? I mean, I, I, I don't know if your data allowed you to investigate okay. uh, 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 that. And one more point I was curious, sorry. 
Yeah. <laughs> you mentioned the Tablighi Jamaat and their influence. Uh, you know, there's been some issues in Singapore as well. <laughs> These influences, are they being transmitted from Bangladesh or are they coming in from external sources uh, in, in, in the broader? Um, obviously, I'm, I'm thinking okay. of the Wahhabi or the okay. Salafist influence. Yeah. yeah, that's a very good question. I, I thought, yeah, I expected this question from. Um, uh, Thank you for asking the question. It's very nice to hear from you also. And we share the same university at the university level, uh, undergraduation. My, we did the same, in, we studied the same university. Remittance is a private money. It's not the public money. So if we say that it's a offsetting, or that's the state doing hot, it's not money, it's a private money. Migration decision is a private decision. People come in Singapore. It's a st the individual initiated process. So now migrant or as uh, institutions helping the process. Institution means government helping the process. But it's an individual dr driven process. Social cost of migration, I did not talk about it. It's a, I mean, uh, uh, we know the poetry. We can see how the, the people fleeing. But I like to mention it's very simple, uh, a, a sociological concept that is migration is a career or migration is for two years, three years. People after university join the civil service, become IAS, BCS officer. And that's the occupation. People at the age of 25 coming to Singapore, then going to Russia, Poland, ended up in Germany, opened Domi pizza shop. Now he's a millionaire in Bonn. Individual decided to migrate and move from one country to another country, settled in Germany. So it's a completely individual decision. It's a career path they are taking. As the government, people, uh, government is helping the process and reduce the exploitation in the, out of the migrants. There is a control mechanisms, but you need to understand this is an individual project, individual initiative, and remittances is also individual, private. Uh, Bari name, but how Bari important? We call Bari is a collection of homes. Homes means houses. Here, family house is very. Uh, it's a very conceptual. Yeah, I don't go into the details. But it's a home. There is a home, and it's a, a few homes constitute a bari. Bari. Everybody has a name. Even usually, that n names come from lineage, like caste system. But what happens? The migration changes. This traditional lineage based name system. We call it, this is Singapore, Singapore Bari, this is Canada Bari. It means someone from that house have gone to Canada. And that Canada Bari, that name goes beyond village, beyond union, beyond even sometimes uh, upajela or district. For example, Pro Dr. Chaudhary mentioned that three MPs of Bangladeshi origin in UK at this moment. So if we go there, houses, They'll say, oh, that MP house. And that MP house is known, whole district, that that person houses that place, that village. So Bari is so important. And I believe the same level of analysis we found in South Asia as well, especially the lineage-based. But in the migration researcher, they don't look at that. And there should be more research on that. Your political or spousal remittances, we understand that it's a, uh, I mean, it's, it's a all, all about power and the family who control the resources of the family. And that control lead to, and that's a very, I mean, I mean the Sarah thing new, everyone wants to control the family resources, right? It goes to. And since remittances comes through formal channel, go to the father, then they can control. If goes from informal channel, goes to informal channel, the hundi man, the person who deliver, is a contact, you go and give to my wife. I once give to someone's wife, I went, I said, who are you? And now very difficult, this father asking, who are you? I say, actually, I was going from here, I like to pray. Then I go and say, you want to pray at my house? Okay, yes, I was going from this way, but it's uh, my grip time, so I like to pray, for example. Then I went to pray, and uh, after pray, Salam, then a wife came and wife somehow understood because maybe call and then I give the money. So Hundi men play the role like that. 
Now, political Islam, what happens in Bangladesh now? Uh, I mean, uh, there is a different priority uh, on two political parties. Uh, one is the BMP and is Amali. BMP has a form of the alliance with the many Islamic parties. And in the last uh, 2001 to 2009, there is a rise of many fundamentalist activities. Then it's, uh, Aumalik came, Aumalik identified those people who are involved in and, and, and the symptoms of uh, rural level extractions and, and military activities. They cast them and put in the jail. Many then fled the country. They came wherever they could. They went to Middle East countries, they came to South Asia, Southeast Asia, and also East Asia. But I can tell you, they are not by nature fundamentalist, like uh, in, in, in Syria. They are opportunistic with, with religious affiliation, some of them. Malaysia is in trouble because many of them settle in Malaysia under second home and other facilities. Singapore is smart enough, they understood the problem, they case on by on. And Actually, this group of the people who are coming here, they are not that type of that we want, club with all type of things. But they are unhappy, and they know that they cannot make money. It's a, it's, it's a power and wealth, class dimension. And religion is a factor, but it's used as a tool often. But I, I, when I read all this information in Singapore, what is going on, I'm happy to see that government uh, knows the problem and taking serious step. And uh, this is problem with Bangladesh. That should not be exported to any other countries, and uh, that should be strictly uh, handled. Yeah. Well, I think thank you very much. I I will have to conclude. I just want to add my uh, share the uh, convey the same sentiments Professor Mitra and Chaudhary and other have. Your meticulous, carefully designed, and extremely insightful research. Uh, wish you all the very best, but I think what really has impressed me most is your enthusiasm. I think if I could be as enthusiastic as you are doing research, I think I would be delighted. I may be just my age, but I think you are just shown something that your research is not only that what you are advancing knowledge, but it has a certain amount of passion. And I hope that you will never let that go, and I hope that uh, some of it is infectious enough that some of us, you know, will be infected by it. Thank you very much for your contribution. Thank you for coming, and welcome back. And yeah. we we'll hope to see you soon again. And thank, thank you very much for your presence. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I think I have a book here, which I'm supposed to. Uh, um, Sheila, is that the book for the me or for the? Oh. <laughs> it's your book, actually. Yeah, right. right. No, it's all right. All the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.